welcome to this third event in our 2013-14 season of the Provost Forum on the Public University and the Social Good. We're very happy to be back with the second season of these Provost Forums, building upon our successes last year. This afternoon, we're honored to have as our featured speaker, Professor Yochai Benkler of Harvard University. Under any circumstances, we would be highly privileged to hear from a scholar of Professor Benkler's accomplishments and his distinction and insight. But we're doubly privileged in the sense that today he will go boldly where no provost forum speaker has yet gone, at least not in comparable depth. His lecture entitled Open Access, Cooperation and Commons, the Uncertain Retreat of Possessive Individualism in Network Society will consider issues pertaining to our digitally connected society and economy that are very relevant to our ongoing dialogue on the public university. There are plenty of seats up here. Um, Professor Benkler and his topic will receive a proper introduction in just a moment by Professor Mario Biagioli of our law school and social sciences, but I cannot help resist observing here that some of the ideas that Professor Benkler holds with special reverence, for example, the commons, sharing, cooperation, and what he calls a more productive economy that is more social, humane, and democratic, strongly resonate with the public service mission of the public university. Appropriately, these very ideas also have a strong analog in a document entitled A Vision of Excellence, which affirms the mission and defines high-level goals for our campus as we move forward. Crucially, Professor Benkler is also interested in present and future threats to the realization of the, and I quote, more productive, social, humane, and democratic economy, end quote. As you will see, these threats are not unconnected to those that afflict the public university. We must wait to hear Professor Bankler's uh, speech to discover the price balance of worry and hope in his analysis of our situation. But we already know that his presentation will be both revelatory and provocative. Uh, I invite you to continue the dialogue during the reception in this room immediately following the lecture. I have to tell you that today's lecture will be followed by six more during this academic year. In the coming months, distinguished guest speakers will address a variety of topics related to public higher education from a variety of perspectives. These subjects include accessibility and affordability, economic conditions, legal issues pertaining to intellectual property, scientific research, academic freedom, the value and role of the humanities, and the public university's contribution to regional development and campus diversity. Here I'd like to sneak in a quick plug for our next forum as it will be coming upon us rather quickly. A week from tomorrow or Friday the 21st, we'll hear Professor Naomi Oreskes of Harvard University speak on the topic, the university and the public good, what should we be doing on climate change? Her lecture will be held at 3 p.m. in the Student Community Center and a reception will follow that. I hope that all of you will be able to attend many, if not all, of this year's remaining lectures. If you do miss one, videos of all events, along with other materials, will be easily accessible on my website. I wish personally to thank the Provost Forum's organizing committee for doing such an excellent job in planning and arranging our events, both this year and last. My office's co-sponsors for this series, the Mellon Digital Cultures Initiative, the UC Davis School of Law, the Community and Regional Development Program, and the Center for Regional Change. Professor Mario Biagioli of the UC Davis School of Law for moderating today's forum, and finally, you, Professor Bankler, for speaking with us today. Thank you all for participating. Um, this, uh, um, this visit by Professor Benkler has been a, a multi-authored uh, performance that has uh, uh, involved both uh, uh, human and uh, institutional uh, actors. Uh, so uh, Provost Exeter uh, mentioned some of the institutional uh, uh, sponsors, so I would like to uh, thank the, the, the human uh, team, uh, and especially uh, Martin Kenney, uh, Colin Milburn, Chris Ravetto, uh, Casey Castaldi, and Alison Fish and uh, Chris Fallon for all the help. Um, my most uh, uh, heartfelt thanks, however, go to the cold front that was moving up the East Coast yesterday, <laughs> but slowed down, perhaps miraculously, at the Rhode Island-Massachusetts border. 
uh, just enough to create a window so that uh, uh, Professor Bankler's plane could take off uh, before the snow got really nasty in Boston. So thank you, whatever meteorological entity uh, you, you might have been involved in this. Um, so when uh, uh, last summer, uh, Jonathan Eisen, Mackenzie uh, Smith, and I uh, start talking about uh, who we should invite to deliver the, uh, the keynote uh, lecture at, the, uh, at this conference, uh, there was an immediate consensus on uh, uh, Yokai's name. Uh, although there is not a, a, an absolute literal uh, you know, overlap between the topic of the conference and uh, uh, Yokai's work, uh, it was very clear to us that uh, his uh, research on peer production and collaboration that he laid out in many publications and, and then uh, uh, put together in the, the book, the, the Wealth of uh, Networks, um, has provided and continues to provide the analytical framework for the kind of uh, uh, work that we are discussing here today and uh, uh, tomorrow. So uh, given the audience that uh, uh, we have here, uh, I don't need to recite the whole list of his uh, uh, impressive achievements, but I don't want to be too cool either and, uh, and, and uh, don't say anything. So here, here is the, the, the basic, the very basic uh, list. Uh, he's the Berkman uh, Professor of Entrepreneurial Legal Studies at the Harvard uh, Law School, and where he also co-directs the Berkman uh, Center. And he has been recognized by various awards from the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, the American Political Science Association, the American Sociological Association, uh, the McGannon Award for Social and Ethical Relevance in Communication, the Ford Foundation Visionary Award, and in 2012, a Lifetime Achievement Award from Oxford University, which is, must be bizarre to receive uh, a lifetime achievement. Like, you know, you, 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 you feel good, right? <laughs> um, so, um, let's, so I mentioned, I mentioned the way uh, I think that uh, Professor Benkler's uh, uh, research really frames a lot of the conversation that we have been having. Um, it is perhaps hard to recall how uh, just 20 years ago or less, uh, there was widespread skepticism about the introduction and promotion of models of cultural production that invoked uh, the commons, uh, peer collaboration, and uh, non-economic uh, incentive. Um, and also that conversation, the kind of things that people were talking about then was free software, mostly free software and open source. We were, we were not talking about the many varieties of uh, uh, peer productions that uh, uh, we have we have today. So at the time, the the, the skeptics or the critics of uh, these commons-based models tended to be uh, with uh, you know in the law and economics school or, or or economic school. And their point was that look, if there is no uh, economic incentive in this model, you know th these are effectively hobbies. You know the kind of uh, uh, practices that can be uh, pursued must be done by people who have a day job. The promoters, instead, they took a different line and often stressing, uh, if you want, ethical concerns. So they mobilized a certain way of uh, a notion of a public, and, and uh, Chris Kelty has uh, worked uh, extensively on that, on notions of you know, progressive uh, social values, uh, kind of some kind of geeky coolness uh, connected to it, as well as typically a critical stance toward uh, intellectual property in general. So, um, uh, Yokai's sympathies were obviously with uh, the latter group, and actually he has been a, a leading uh, member of, of, uh, of the group. But he pursued that goal from taking an importantly different perspective. So, um, that is, he didn't just look at, uh, of course he was inspired by what, what was happening with uh, free software and so on, but he didn't limit himself just to look at those cases, uh, but he just, he, look, he took a comparative perspective looking at what kind of practices uh, can, uh, are best suited for a market framework, what uh, uh, kind of innovation and cultural production is best suited to firms, and then 
let's look at uh, what are the best practice, the, the, the kind of practices that instead would be uh, best uh, pursued in the commons. So the commons were not just seen as simply a critical uh, alternative to the market or the firm, but rather, look, the commons work particularly well when the products involves information and uh, uh, peer sharing is important in very specific way. So rather than criticizing the uh, law and economics tradition and say, look, uh, you economists are missing the boat because you don't understand that we don't need uh, uh, financial incentives to produce culture. He basically said, we need to expand the repertoire of economic analysis to be able to make sense, economic sense of the commons. So in my, in my view, uh, he managed to make uh, uh, the commons look normal, which in my view is an extraordinary achievement. So uh, let, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Benkler to Davis. Well, thank you all for inviting me. Thank you uh, to the provost for your kind uh, introduction. Thank you, Mario, for this uh, incredibly um, <clears throat> generous description. Uh, um, I was reminded when you talked about the weather, there's a Hasidic story about a rabbi who had a, a, a miracle happen to him. He was coming to the village, and as he was progressing to the village, Friday was coming, uh, was ending, the Sabbath was coming down, but a miracle happened. Sabbath went on the right, Sabbath went on the left, but where he was, it was still a secular day. <laughs> so it goes. Um, <clears throat> I am going to have to beg your uh, patience and ask for your criticism, because what I'm going to try to present to you is in some sense a talk at war with itself. It's an effort to try to understand the relationship between the way the world seemed to work five or six years ago and the things we're beginning to look at that suggest a real destabilization of some of these uh, very positive trends, but at the same time an enactment <coughs> of um, some of the things we thought would work that are working even more powerfully. And how we think about the implications of the practice of commons-based production generally, of cooperation and, sh and peer production specifically, from the perspective of our understanding of the economy and our understanding of our relationships as a political community um, uh, taken together. And I say it's at war with itself because in order to set up the constraints, I'll in some sense say things that are more utopian in their sense of where things are going than I today perhaps believe they will, but hopefully by the end, uh, and I'm, we'll talk for about an hour unless I see heads drooping and then I'll speed up and we'll uh, have questions before and then open for conversation. Um, so here's the basic story. Once upon a time, there was a fantastic business model. You published 32 volumes. You wrapped them in a proprietary copyright. You stamped them with the authority of the great universities. And you went door to door, and you had people buy them for thousands of dollars. Then digitization came along. And as a couple of the world's leading information economists in 1909 explained in their second chapter of their book, it would change everything. And Britannica would come under attack from Encarta. Because you had network economics, they would integrate them with the platform, it would be interactive, you could update it more quickly, you could have a much more economically efficient mechanism, and this was the epitome of information rules. And indeed, Britannica fell from thousands to $500 on a CD. Uh, shame of shames, you could ultimately get it for $29.95 on buycheapsoftware.com. But of course, we know that it wasn't in Carta that did that to Britannica. When Jimmy Wales put 900 stubs on the net, paying no one to write and no one to edit, anyone who would have stood up and said within five years, nature would plausibly compare Britannica and Wikipedia on science articles. Within 10, it would become the basic knowledge utility 
that is integrated into our lives would have been laughed out of the room. Let me tell you, I know. I started studying Wikipedia for the first time when it was six months old. There was a lot of laughter and mockery. Um, and yet, it moves. And as it moved, it taught us something about the possibility of classic mutualist or anarchist production, the capacity for people to self-organize outside of the market, outside of the state, to produce a sustained long-term good. And of course, in 2009, we know that Encarta um, 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 went uh, um, uh, into um, um, a different place. <laughs> then there was always the argument, and Mario identified it, there was always the argument with the economists who said, but the market. So I've been using this graphic now for over a decade. Uh, and and uh, there were some moments of, of fear in the middle, say when MySpace became very big and adopted uh, Windows Server, it looked like the gap was growing. Actually, today they're much closer to each other because of a whole set of servers hosted by spammers that use Microsoft. But um, essentially what this tells us for Apache is that when Microsoft began to write the server in 95 as the next future platform, and the bunch of engineers who came together to produce Apache came together and also did it on this model of uh, free software. Again, it would have been laughable to imagine that over the course of 19 years now, over cycles of boom and bust, over growth into a commercial platform, Apache would continue to be the dominant platform and the fastest growing alternative is Nginx, which is also false. And so again, all of those who talk about the market as the source of discipline have to answer this. Otherwise, they're, all, they're just idealists. The market and property should work in theory. It's just in practice in this domain, property seems to be losing. Those became the basic foundational stories we have for peer production and cooperation. And here, the little bit of it war with itself. Six or seven years ago, I would have not expected Wikipedia to continue to be so unique in its position. It remains unique. We need to answer for that to ourselves. Broadly speaking, one way of organizing our understanding about what we learned from the last 20 years of the emergence of commons-based and peer production can be understood if we organize economic production system into these four boxes as to whether they're centralized or decentralized and market-based and non-market-based. With regard to whether we're using the price system, whether we're using firms, whether we're using governments or large nonprofits, or whether we're using social relations to deliver a range of goods and services necessary for human welfare. And if we were to characterize the first 60, 65 years of the 20th century uh, very coarsely, we would say that they were characterized by the increasing commitment to the idea that hierarchical organization was the primary mode of rationalization. It was how we delivered these services in a way that was reliable, high quality, and not uh, perturbed by uh, the uncertainties of the market and the irrationalities of uh, imperfect systems. And we saw that in the growth of large firms and conglomerates up till we got things like ITT that didn't know what the left hand and the right hand had anything to do in the same one. And we got it with the rise of uh, the administrative state uh, to sizes that later on uh, backfired. The 80s and 90s were again, and again, I'm not telling a story you don't know, if you think of the Reagan uh, Thatcher revolution, very much across multiple domains of thought and political action, we saw the introduction of the, pri of the price system as a response to the perceived systemic failures when organization became so big that they were unable to process their own information. They were unable to control themselves sufficiently well, and the only game we knew intellectually that was in town was the market. Rationalization, instead of through hierarchy and organization, could be done through abstraction into prices. And so you had internal pricing within firms, 
where various divisions needed. You had universities suddenly setting up that this division has to pay for that division for the time and whatever it is. And you began to see, say, Gary Becker get a Nobel Prize for explaining how uh, things that are basically social can still be understood best uh, on a model of, of uh, self-interested rationality. What the networked information economy has done, what free and open source software, what Wikipedia, and what the broad practices that we've all come to know as commons-based production, as peer production, as uh, social production, as sharing, whatever it is that we use to, to name them, is the emergence not of a complete displacement of these other domains of production, but a stable model of production alongside these others that has effectively become a solution space for many classes of projects. Some purely within the social production system, some then as integrated solutions that players within the other quadrants are now integrating social production and peer production uh, into their framework. So we have uh, whether it's the, the, the volunteer task force that helps uh, uh, the UN uh, uh, High Commissioner and Refugee map satellite images to find, um, um, to find the location of refugees in order to get aid faster. We have the ideal of recovery.gov, of people actually looking to get transparency. We obviously had what we already talked about. From the day in which IBM, it was about 2002 that IBM, the largest patent holder in the United States, uh, was reporting more revenues from Linux-related services than from all patent royalties uh, put together. And that was, in some sense, a transition, a conceptual transition moment for many participants in the industry. Uh, obviously, we see all of these other players. We see some news organizations, The Guardian more so than others. The BBC was very early on, beginning to build platforms that integrate their traditional goal, role with the introduction of information from the periphery. And we see various startups, building models, so TripAdvisor challenging Fodor's, Yelp challenging Zagat or whatever else, all by essentially building platforms to collect insights from people who are doing it for a variety of social uh, motivations. As I say, it's become a solution space rather than a curiosity. Why? The argument I made years ago, and which I restate here because it will be the basis from which I want to try to explain where I see the potential threats at the, level to, at the technological level, was that for the first time, the most important inputs of the most productive economies were widely spread in the population, particularly in those areas of the economy that were the highest growth uh, and the highest activity. So essentially, the material capital computation and communications, sensing and storage, um, and human. Uh, creativity, insight, diversity of, of experience, uh, and the capacity for social self-organization. All of these were radically distributed in the population, such that behaviors that were once on the periphery, that we could always have played with each other, friendship, um, um, uh, mutual aid, family, uh, fun, having, uh, be hanging out together, all these came together and shifted from being incredibly important socially to being also very significant economically. They became a mode of production alongside all of the others, and it's the efficacy that made them part of a solution space. Very important to separate and for the open access movement in particular to focus on commons-based production rather than only on peer production and sharing and see the relationship between the two. By commons-based production, I mean production that, base, that is based on utilization of re a resource set that no one exerts co exclusive rights over, um, appropriating the outputs without, uh, without, uh, without exercising exclusive rights. It doesn't have to be collaborative. It can be individual. Uh, and it doesn't have to be non-commercial. It can be commercial. The critical defining feature is the absence of exclusive uh, uh, proprietary claims as the basis for the production model. Um, so if we don't want to look online, classic views of science are like this. Trucks using roads are commons-based uh, model of transportation. A party in the park as opposed to the backyard. 
as I said, can be individual or collaborative, commercial or non-commercial. What's important here is that the rise of the commons made the authority to act as decentralized as the technological happenstance of the fabrication technology of computation made capital capacity. So capital capacity was radically distributed because of the way PCs developed. And the commons located authority to act where capacity to act was. You didn't have to ask for permission. The combination of these allowed for all of these behaviors, both individual and collective. Mario talked about the way in which different people talk about the commons, and you've written about this. I think, and this is something that I've been writing about more in the last year and a half or so, I think it's, <clears throat> for a long time, we were all fellow travelers because we were all uh, rejected by the standard story of the 80s and 90s of privatization and property uh, uh, for everything. I think it's very important today to begin to unpack, now that we're comfortable in our own skins understanding that commons work, to begin to unpack what it means. Lynn Ostrom got the Nobel Prize in Economics for fantastic work, but the school she built is a school whose own internal definitions would exclude highways would exclude TCP IP, would exclude Wi-Fi. General open access commons that anyone can use and no one is part of a standing community, those are not Ostrom commons. Instead, the Ostrom school largely answered the question of the logic of collective action. It showed in exquisite detail how people could come together in the absence of a formal state and in the absence of formal property and manage their affairs in ways that ha ex exhibited far greater knowledge as to local conditions, such that they were better and more sustainable and more effective than the more abstract models, whether they were property or administration. The school that came out of the people who studied networks, and in some sense the first piece on this is Carol Rose's piece on waterways and roads in 86, and that's a different kind of network. But most of the work was done in the area of people who were working on public domain and, and, and network technologies, was radically different. It was precisely the indeterminate set of people able to come into the commons. That was central to the definition of what made commons like roads and waterways uh, and TCP IP uh, uh, work. Um, and it was not driven by a stable, slow-moving community. It was driven by growth change and rapid adaptation to radically changed conditions. So radically different conception of the commons. I think today in work, for example, that, that, that uh, uh, um, uh, Michael Madison and Catherine Strandberg and, and Brett Frischman are doing together, there's really interesting effort to try to take what we learn of the governance model from the Austrian model to what we see in the actual open commons models to see how they manage. I think many of the conversations from the little bit, I'm sorry that I missed earlier in the day, I'll be here all of tomorrow, but when you talk about peer review and the way in which you manage the commons, you're essentially layering one school over the other in terms of the governance model. And then there's another class of work on the commons that has to do, that probably has more to do with its roots in environmentalism, that is really quite powerfully uh, opposed to the idea of uh, growth. It's more about husbandry and management and, and, and removal from the relentless dynamic of the market. And so there's a real tension there that we'll need to think about, uh, but I won't spend too much time on that. I'm really talking about the first two uh, 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 here. Peer production refers to the collaborative uh, model of variously sized collections of individuals effectively producing information good without price signals or managerial commands. And I'd say that as specifically as an organizational innovation, it's the most significant organizational innovation of the last 15 or so years because it was impossible and now it actually exists as a working model producing a steady flow of goods throughout uh, uh, the economy. Um, but the reason that I define it in this negative form is because, is because it specifically is an alternative model to these other goods, but it's an organizational strategy within uh, um, uh, a commons environment. And 
The sharing of material resources has a slightly different economics that I won't go into here, but again, as part of the solution space, we have classes of goods or, or capital uh, goods that we have in our pockets, in our hands, that have enough excess capacity under certain conditions that we can share them. And that's where we see, to some extent, we share our labor and our work and our uh, uh, help to each other, and to some extent, we share our goods, and together, these form the solution space of peer production and sharing. Um, when we look at the set of challenges that characterized the first decade and a half, I'd say, of the emergence of the commons, the critical battles were over whether there would be a sufficiently robust commons in each and every critical capital component for commons-based production such that there would be no gateway that could easily be controlled by someone who was proprietary or hierarchical to prevent the effective uh, 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 deployment of peer production and commons-based production. And so I've been using this and adding various layers and taking them out over the years as I saw different threats. But basically the idea is that physical components, be they transport or devices, logical components at various layers, and content, uh, uh, if, if, that's, if we're willing to use that very crude uh, term, uh, the idea is that in order for a commons to be effective, in order for it to still be the case that you don't have to ask permission, that authority to act lo is located where capacity to act resides, you have to have commons in each and every one of these layers, at least a commons of first and last resort so that the bottleneck is not too powerful. And battles, for example, over trusted systems are precisely battles over whether we'll introduce a layer that will completely uh, uh, close up one of the systems. And it doesn't have to be commons. PCs are not about commons. They're about standardized uh, 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 um, um, components that are sufficiently competitive that you don't have a choke point, not about actual commons. Wi-Fi is about commons. Um, and in fact, what we've seen over the years is that is successful deployment of commons at all of these layers. And I'll just do sort of a, a breathless run through of a few of them. So the thing that introduced me to, wi -Fi, to, to, to what would end up being Wi-Fi later was Dave Byer's 1996 uh, presentation on rooftop community networks, a company that was later uh, sold to Nokia and was Nokia rooftops over here in Mountain View and then died because it was about a decade uh, too uh, ahead of its time. Um, and that's where I started writing about the ability to write Wi-Fi. And the only reason I put this up here because I suddenly saw that I uh, had published it under the GNU FDL, which was the only off-the-shelf open access license uh, that I uh, had available to me at the time. Uh, so there it is. Um, um, it took a long time for Spectrum Commons to be understood as critical. Even as recently as 2010, the National Broadband Plan still wrote about the critical thing is to make 500 megahertz private property. Three years later, the President's Task Force on Spectrum wrote, the essential element of this new federal spectrum architecture is that the norm for spectrum use should be sharing, not exclusivity. An absolute sea change in the conception of the necessity of property as opposed to the impossibility of property in one of the frontiers on which, uh, I mean, this is not marginal. This is one of the frontiers of auction theory and property theory and this, that, the other that collapsed under its own weight. We've seen it now. Smart grid communications is overwhelmingly served. Everything that's green is using unlicensed. Everything that's red or orange is using um, 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 property, uh, exclusive property. Smart grids, overwhelmingly, the market is now uh, unlicensed. Uh, healthcare, overwhelmingly, the market is unlicensed in all of these areas, all of these things that we were told were the next generation of cellular are all unlicensed. Mobile now is overwhelmingly uh, unlicensed in terms of the amount of data uh, carried. So that's on physical transport. On distributed storage, I found this from a presentation on critical infrastructures uh, from a decade ago. You began to see people saying, let's build distributed storage such that it's robust to attack. So Ian Clark had Freenet, uh, uh, John Kubiatovic had uh, OpenStore. Today's uh, 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 idea is Freedom Box. 
uh, though it no longer really is a plug server. It's more software, and we'll see where it goes. But the point I'm trying to make with all of these is we've seen a continuation of flow of efforts to use material sharing as a core component of producing goods that we once thought had to have property. And Spectrum, in this regard, has been the most powerful. Uh, and of course, this is again from 10 years ago, uh, SETI at home on, co on computation. At the software layer, this is not an ancient uh, front uh, 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 page for the IETF. This is from yesterday. Um, and it's still the case that rough consensus and running code and open process, any interested person can participate, is uh, uh, the rule. This is the basic, uh, uh, the basic protocol uh, we've already talked about uh, free and open source software, but obviously we've seen it in the browser statistics. Again, solution space. Fifteen years ago, only, only the state through its power in the U.S. and Europe could break up Microsoft's dominant over, or dominance over the browser. And even though it was found to be an antitrust violation and, 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 and penalties were imposed, that's not where the turning point was. The turning point was when Netscape handed over the code to Mozilla, created the Mozilla Foundation, and Firefox began uh, to emerge. And today, that's been the real source of competition. We see dominance of free software in, in, in server-side programming languages, in um, um, uh, uh, authorship tools. It's become a much more uh, successful model. And then we come up to content. We know the rise of creation, Creative Commons, the emergence of free culture as a uh, uh, as a movement. Um, uh, uh, once upon a time, it was a, it was a, it was a pledge, wasn't it, uh, Jonathan? Uh, once upon a time, it was a pledge, but then uh, people actually needed a place to publish. Uh, at least their students did. So you built, uh, uh, so you built a publishing system. But um, that's for a moment, back to this conference. Open access from the very start from 15, 13 years ago, uh, I guess, it's really before that, this is already out, um, is part of that general assertion of the feasibility and necessity of a commons-based resource set into which we all produce and out of which we all produce in the next generation in resistance to a model of complete appropriation of what is essentially labor, all of it produced by uh, the community itself. Uh, and we move on to uh, uh, today's, uh, um, uh, to today's uh, 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 much broader acceptance, both at the political level, at the institutional level, uh, the work you've been doing. Um, it's uh, fantastic. And we see also now the excitement about um, um, distributed science. Um, um, and the ability of people to collaborate to produce science. So that's just sort of a whirlwind of um, here's what I was about to say and here's what I'll say. A whirlwind of utopian uh, excitement about the possibilities, but it's not just utopian excitement. Right? I haven't actually told you stories that aren't true. They're there. Even in our skeptical mode, even as we're self-reflective, there's a reality out there that things that 15 years ago were laughable and couldn't work are just part of life. That has power too. Now, up till now I presented commons-based and peer production as um, congenial, as playing nicely with, with, with uh, other modes of production, particularly uh, uh, market and firm-based capitalist production. But the existence and success of commons-based and peer production also puts pressure on certain core pillars of the belief system that characterized our understanding of the ascendance of liberal capitalism through the 90s. Uh, in ways that are quite significant. Um, first and foremost uh, is uh, the necessity of hierarchy. Right? The fact that you actually are able to see people self-organize in ways that are uh, antithetical to command hierarchies uh, is important here. 
And it's not a marginal question, right? So you have some of the most foundational writing on organization and some of the most foundational management science of production essentially takes the problem of constraining the shirking employee all the way down from the line to just below the CEO as the core problem that defines what the firms. Williamson gets his Nobel Prize in economics the same year as Lynn Ostrom for making that particular point. That is to say that the core competence of firms is to control shirking. Um, at the same time, you have the layering of this necessity of hierarchy into a model of self-interest that is seen as a universal characteristic of rationality. For a very long time, all of the studies of deviations from self-interest are lumped together with deviations from rationality in the behavioral economics uh, movement. Um, but here, really, at the moment, this, 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 this Jensen and Murphy uh, 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 principal agent model that really says, if everybody needs to be controlled in their shirking below the CEO, who will control the CEO? And the answer is, you can't control the CEO with hierarchy. You have to align the incentives with, um, um, with the shareholders. And therefore, you need to grant stock options. This was a theory very congenial to the relevant businesses. And so they all adopted it from 89 on. It took Jensen and Murphy no more than 10 or 12 years to tur turn around and say this was a total bloody disaster. <laughs> because essentially what we got was rent seeking and rent extraction by the, uh, uh, by the uh, CEOs with a good bit of studies in the last 10 years suggesting that that shift has been extremely disruptive. And so what we have is a critique of universal self-interest as an adequate model. And the last component is the tyranny, of the, uh, the tyranny of the margin. And by the tyranny of the margin, I mean capitalism not as controlled by the capitalists of the workers, but as the logic of accumulation driving everyone to be forced to act at the margin, to be forced to act efficiently, to be forced to uh, um, um, locate the jobs wherever they're cheapest, to be able to, to, to extract from the finance whatever they can extract, not as a matter of choice to control and power, but as a matter of uh, 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 a universal uh, subjugation of everyone, labor, workers, and capital, uh, to the same logic. And so this was one of the great, did any of you, did you see this uh, uh, ever? You really should see it. But there's this moment at which Henry Waxman is questioning uh, Alan Greenspan right after the collapse. Uh, I made a mistake in presuming that the self-interest of organizations, specifically banks and others, were such as that they were the best capable uh, of protecting their own shareholders. Later on, he says, I found a flaw in the model that I perceived as the critical functioning structure that defines how the world works, so to speak. I had been going for 40 years or more with considerable evidence that it is working exceptionally well. Intellectually, it's a sea change, but it comes at a time that both the practice of so many people in their real lives denies it. And there's a massive intellectual change across multiple disciplines that follows the same model. So if you look at an, evolu at an arc across many disciplines from the late 50s, early 60s, through the late 90s, early 2000s, what you see is a similar arc away from various kinds of collective uh, uh, explanations two explanations based on individual self-interest. So in evolutionary biology, you move from group selection to uh, kin altruism and direct reciprocity of selfish gene. In economics, you see the extremely strong assumptions of self-interest and, and, and uh, self-interest and guile. Mechanism design becomes central. Uh, efficiency becomes central. In political theory, you see from Downs to, Al to Olson to Hardin the impossibility of collective action. Uh, and in management science, you see the shift that we already talked about from, from uh, Taylor, Weber, and Schumpeter to uh, Williamson. But what you see in the last 20 years, and in some sense earliest in management science and organization in the mid 80s, uh, a little more, uh, a little later, a little then uh, uh, Ostrom on the commons, and then economics and evolution uh, uh, join really only in the last 10, 12 years is the shift to direct, indirect reciprocity and multi-level selection, to experimental uh, work on cooperation and modeling away from self-interest, uh, 
to Ostrom, as I said, and to a variety of, of, of uh, both organizational sociology and management science that begins to look at the high commitment, high performance organization, at the firm as collaborative community. These are the kinds of things people are beginning to look at. So you see a shift of this period across all of these intellectual areas that meets this first. So those were the 40 years that Greenspan is talking about. They're not only 40 years in economics. They're 40 years across multiple disciplines that tell a similar story of a rise of universality of self-interest as a good explanatory model for many, many things. And then the last 10, 15 years, at roughly the same time that the social practice of collaboration emerges, we also see the emergence of, an int of, of intellectual traditions. And sometimes it's fascinating, right? You look at, um, uh, uh, at Lynn Ostrom's uh, presidential address to the Political Science Association covering the experimental work in political science on deviations from self-interest. And then you read a, similarly, uh, a similar uh, early 2000, a couple of years later, by uh, Ernst Fair um, um, uh, uh, um, on the economics experimental uh, work. And they're both running similar experiments, finding similar results, these big literatures, and they don't know about each other at all. It's not that they're ungenerous in their quotation. They're just essentially uh, running the same set of things parallel side by side. So that essentially today we're beginning to see much more effectively uh, the understanding that what we learn from multiple disciplines begins to define a series of vectors of motivation that you can no longer imagine simply line up and align so that if you add money you'll get more of something or if you add punishment you'll get less of it. Instead what we're seeing increasingly is experimental, theoretical work that begins to show that we have diverse, that begins to show what we already all know, which is that we have diverse motivations, that you can't intervene in a way that's discrete to one motivation without necessarily impacting in opposite directions as, as competing forces other motivations, um, and that you need to build much more socially complex systems of production in order to uh, capture all of these. Um, let me frame it this way. And, 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 and Mario, you focused on it as a, about the early um, um, effort to translate uh, between different uh, uh, disciplines. And, and this is also an effort of that kind of translation. Um, Part of the task we face is to explain why the tyranny of the margin is bad for business, not only uh, uh, a bad model of uh, human uh, behavior and a bad way of living. Um, and I think one of the things that, uh, um, uh, and this is something that I'm beginning to try to work out as a way of explaining the diversity of collaborative practices that have emerged both among firms and in the network and uh, in, in the nonprofit sector along a dimension of understanding the degree of complexity, uncertainty, and change in the project environment that uh, all of these organizations uh, um, um, address. Um, so if you imagine these three dimensions, one is the, the kind of knowledge necessary to perform a task, whether it's routine or knowledge intensive, and particularly whether it's tacit uh, and based on insight. The project space, whether it's predictable and well-defined, or whether it's diverse, uncertain, or complex. And the capital space, whether you need, what's the minimal amount of capitalization you need in order to be effective, whether it's high or low. And then you imagine two frontiers, one of well-known things along these dimensions, and the other of known probabilities, and the other of true uncertainty. What you see is a is a move from classic managerial hierarchies working well at the core of this uh, space and some of the things we've been talking about moving out to the periphery. Because essentially what we get here are several trade-offs. One is do we understand the incentives very clearly because we understand the project and the people very clearly or do we need diverse motivations that primarily include intrinsic motivation? Is our task optimization or is it exploration and experimentation? And is our concern appropriability in order to cover the capital 
or is our concern primarily freedom to operate precisely because what we need is experimentation and we need some mode of production that will not alienate people uh, from their work. And along all of these three dimensions, we essentially then see a variety of practices that come under the, the faddy term of open innovation, but really include a large variety of activities. So one of the things we see is people often use crowdsourcing uh, for peer production. Uh, crowdsourcing, I think of as Amazon uh, Mechanical Turk. That is to say, a highly predetermined task distributed uh, for very routine uh, activity by comparison to commons-based production or peer production that actually requires diverse insight, diverse motivation, diverse uh, uh, perspective and practice. And then we see a variety of other things that, that, that bridge these because they're somewhere in the middle. And I'm happy to go back to it later. But what I want to capture here is that what we're seeing is a variety of practices that trade off these major dimensions of trade-off in terms of the kinds of incentives, the importance of freedom to operate versus appropriability, and the centrality of experimentation and exploration as opposed to optimization that occupy a project space that is much more complex than one that can be uh, uh, described as one-dimensional and running along incentives. Essentially, we have, if we would want to be crude about it, the internet paradigm of production and the uh, 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 industrial model uh, the, the, uh, of production. Complexity, uncertainty, and change as opposed to uh, predictable, calculable risk and well-behaved change that can be priced out. Diversity, experimentation, and innovation as opposed to control, efficiency, and stability. Adaptive learning, running on late binding design as opposed to planned, optimized, and tightly coupled design. And essentially, institutionally, commons, cooperation, intrinsic motivation, and socially embedded work, as opposed to proprietary managed hierarchy, intrinsic incentive, and alienated labor. Now, this isn't to say there are only two kinds of ways of running the world. These are the opposing ideal type paradigms. And you see efforts more or less successful to mix and match them. But that's the, 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 the spectrum. And what I had not really appreciated as I was trying, and, and what I think we need to start to think about uh, as we move to a more critical stance rather than one that's more congenial to a liberal framing is that we also see the difference between alienated labor uh, uh, and the relentless pursuit of the margin as opposed to socially embedded work. And that these are different classes of ways of thinking about work and the extent to which they need to be responsive to efficiency in the margin as opposed to the extent to which they need to be understood as sustainable in the way that we use sustainable for environment, but in terms that are social and political. That is to say, the extent to which, uh, uh, the extent to which these models of production are sustainable in the teeth of the creation of a very extreme distinction between a small number of knowledge workers and highly financed uh, um, uh, players and a very large number of um, uh, either out of work or minimally employed uh, people. Um, it's getting late, so I'm going to skip over things that I think are less important and move on to other things. Um, just at the high level, as part of the process of normalizing this quite radical conception of diversity of, socially, of models of socially embedded work, we're beginning to see in computer science, to a certain extent in innovation management in firms, uh, the understanding of the importance of building cooperative human uh, systems, shifting from rationality to, di to, to, uh, to diverse motivations, rationality models of universal self-interest to diverse motivations, um, uh, and beginning to work through the building blocks of what it makes, of what it means. Primarily here, the understanding that things like fairness and what's right, and things like empathy and solidarity are not layers on top of what motivates and structures production, but are, in fact, central components of making for a productive enterprise. Once you're outside of that very core of highly capitalized, routine, well-understood problems, or at least highly predictable.
So now let me begin to introduce the, um, the uncertainties, or maybe the uncertainties together with the strategies. So one of the concerns I have looking at the work of uh, uh, quite a few young scholars looking at Wikipedia, there's a whole field of Wikipedia studies now, uh, is the reemergence of hierarchy, or the emergence of hierarchy within distributed production. Originally, it was the economists who didn't believe who said, look, Linus, you've got a new CEO. It's not really non-hierarchical. But increasingly, it's quite rich and detailed study of the way in which hierarchy gets uh, organized. So there's a piece uh, that I tried to look at some of this literature, uh, the earliest of, um, uh, of trying to look at the solutions to organization is, is uh, uh, some of the work, some parts of Chris's uh, um, um, two bits. Uh, uh, old work by Biela Coleman on, 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 on um, uh, Debian, uh, uh, Joseph Regal's work on Wikipedia, and there's a whole set uh, in that piece of, of, of sources. And the question is essentially, how do these organizations organize themselves without reproducing hierarchy in a form that is disabling to those at the bottom? Or do they? And here's the, and here's the rough sketch. I mean, the first thing is, the legal stratum is non-proprietary and commons-based, which means that the legal basis for control, the force of the state, is removed off the table. The centrality of rough consensus, the commitment to debate and discourse, no voting to cut off debate, generally speaking, uh, and or assumption of good faith, faith in Wikipedia, uh, shared normative framings, um, Reason, evidence, the idea of running code for purposes of, of, of uh, software or an encyclopedia, neutral point of view in Wikipedia, uh, the strong invocation in nor of norms in Wikipedia, meritocracy, which is something we are so strong at being at, at one level slaves of and at the other level skeptical of because of our own experience of the complexity of defining what it is. Nonetheless, a shared set of, how should I call it, professional norms. And by professional, I, I, I'm, I'm pausing because it's, we see it under, the, under attack in the professions. So if people look at the legal profession or if you look at the medical profession, there's enormous pressure from the market on these norms of professionalism that are intended to make the market imperfect, to, to allow the profession to escape the tyranny of the margin. And now they're under tremendous pressure. We see it in universities as well. Um, uh, some of the questions with MOOCs uh, uh, are obvious. But a very strong reassertion of meritocracy for the particular practice. Nested, redundant, overlapping spheres of power obtained through, contribu through contribution. So it's not that there's one person or five people or ten people who run Wikipedia. There are nested organizations, people who are particularly competent at this, people who are particularly competent at that. It's diversity of constraint that is central. It's degrees of freedom through the creation of diversity of constraint that allows for order without, or not without power, with diffuse power. Um, there are formal institutions and rule, but the, clear, but the critical thing is they're not determinative. They're one of multiple pathways across these organizations. They're one of multiple pathways. There's always resistance. There's always irreverence and irony. There's always uh, uh, the norm against wiki lawyering in uh, 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 Wikipedia, uh, for example, and ignore all rules. Uh, but it's not unique to Wikipedia, that's the point. Leadership exists, but it's limited by other pathways. And, um, and that's the core lesson as I look at these materials, and that is diversity of constraint and multiple pathways as modalities of freedom avoiding not excluding power, which turns out to be impossible, but creating systemic imperfections throughout and multiple redundant pathways for action and pathways for uh, uh, resistance that allow people to bob and weave between uh, to make uh, uh, their own way. I'll skip this. Um, so I'd say the following. Ten years ago, when I tried to visualize what the stakes of uh, 
social production, common space production, peer production were. I tried to describe it in these terms, and this I just literally copied, uh, uh, took a snapshot. Uh, as if you imagine liberal society along different, having different trade-offs of, of values between autonomy, social justice, and democracy, we have this sense that productivity presents an efficient limit on how far we can go in any direction. And then within this, we can live. Otherwise, we're going to end up losing welfare. And the idea was we're actually going to extend the, the, the limit. I think the critical thing that, the, that, that I, I see today as we uh, face the post-Great Recession, uh, post-jobless recovery, uh, uh, the set of anxieties we encounter under sometimes what's now being called the future of work is much better described not along these liberal axes, but along this critical axis of, uh, of alienated labor versus socially embedded labor. And the question becomes for us, a critical design question, is the extent to which we can expand the insights from a relatively narrow domain that we see it today, innovation in firms or innovation in universities, to a more general understanding of what is a socially and politically sustainable within a democracy that cannot sustain excessive inequality, that cannot sustain excessive uh, imbalance of power, to recreate models of production that will replicate some of the things we've seen in the online, not quite laboratory, but at least domain, into the real world for much larger portions of the population. And that's a very different thing than trying to understand merely the liberal values of autonomy, democracy, and distributive justice. Um, so finally, I want to close down by looking at some old school and new school. Here I'm borrowing from something Jack Balkin I'm supposed to comment on on Saturday, uh, uh, on, on, reg on speech regulation. But the idea of old school and new school threats to the distributed models of production. Um, Just to evoke again what was the source of change, the technological source of change that I suggested early on. General purpose computation running on a potentially <coughs> commons-based transport layer with information produced in a collaborative model over standardized uh, 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 non-proprietary standards. Look at this device. It's a proprietary device, highly patented and constrained, running over owned spectrum, coming out of a tradition of a highly controlled device, controlled by the provider, a proprietary network built on proprietary network pr uh, protocols, um, serving, uh, uh, serving owned, uh, 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 owned culture uh, uh, using proprietary software. What's happened with the shift to mobile computing is that the tradition that came out of a device that was just for talking and owned, coming to occupy the same cultural space as a device that was completely open, uh, and overwhelming it in terms of the, 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 the device of first choice. And in this regard, the tablet is even worse. Um, the other thing that happened is, as I said, Dave Byer wrote about rooftop community networks in 96. We've seen people talk about municipal networks, this, that, the other. The reality is that where we see things developing is the carriers are now adopting Wi-Fi. So this is a, a, a model from Ruckus Wireless that's now serving both the number two uh, carrier in the UK and in Japan, using Wi-Fi for what all of the cellular people once thought of as LTE. Uh, we see the control over the App Store becoming a major point of control um, 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 for what can be deployed, which again reintroduces control. Political apps being excluded because they're offensive in some form or another. This particular one is perhaps my favorite because it's a game that actually is, is critical of Apple's uh, manufacture of the iPhone uh, excluded from the App Store. These are the things that are easy for us to say, oh, can you believe it? But I really put them here only to capture the idea of the reassertion of control once this becomes the primary computing platform. Now, HTML is alive and kicking. So certainly when, when uh, uh, um, Apple 
uh, took uh, uh, the, the, an app that allowed people to read the embassy cables out of the app store. It was still available, and most people read it on the web. Uh, um, uh, HTML5 for the Financial Times, when they didn't feel like paying uh, the App Store as much money as the App Store demanded, just rewrote the app as HTML5 uh, and ran it on a general browser. It's still available, but that's precisely the point about the extent to which you continue to have an open component of the framework or not. Uh, illegality and tenuously legal workarounds are absolutely central throughout this space. Um, and this, this is the formal uh, so society-wide uh, uh, um, implementation of the ethic of resistance uh, to authority that we see so much in social production systems. So that's the handheld. The second is cloud services. Again, a, a new model. Uh, they're great, they're wonderful, they're convenient, and they're new points of control. Um, probably you all know this story. Uh, of all of the books that Amazon could have property uh, uh, IP rights with and therefore wiped it off people's Kindles after they bought it already, you couldn't make this up. <laughs> um, but it's true. Hence the New York Times uh, um, uh, copy. Um, and then, of course, you have this. Uh, that is to say, there's a place to take it off. And that becomes a point of control for politicians who say, stop doing business with but this is something also else. This is now the emergence of the public-private partnership for social control. Um, and that is to say an increasing sophistication, both by government agencies and by companies, that they can rely on each other's relative strengths to create points of control. So Sopa Pepa, who I, I'm sure you all remember from uh, 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 almost two, what is it, uh, two years ago now, uh, uh, the, the successful blockage. What's interesting to me is the exquisite way in which that act, not the political organization, which is also interesting to me, uh, uh, and I'm happy to talk about it, but um, the exquisite way in which the act was designed and what was so threatening about it. Essentially, you had Hollywood failing to implement the standard model of just lawsuits and instead introducing a mechanism for relatively weak oversight production of injunctions at the instigation, in some versions of it, of the Justice Department's uh, criminal uh, uh, computer crime division. These very low barrier injunctions basically saying, here's a list of places that might be, uh, uh, that, are, that are suspected of being um, 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 pirate sites could then be fed in to an injunction to require a whole set of other platform providers, DNS service, domain name service providers, um, uh, advertising network providers, uh, search engines, to remove these sites. So that essentially you have private, controlling public, controlling private, to eliminate certain sites from the net with a much lower procedural hurdle than could be done if it were direct public action and with much lower procedural hurdles than if it were direct private action based on proprietary uh, law. And we see a variety of similar such models. Um, we also see in a very crude way in that same model the beginning of use of platforms to shape uh, perspective. So this is a Chrome plugin that when you show up at a site that supports SOPA comes up with internet blacklist litigation supporter. This company may be a supporter of a dangerous SOPA or PIPA Regulation. Now, it depends, right? You might be against SOPA and PIPA and still not think it's so cool for Google to implement an app that says, ooh, careful, these guys have bad ideas. Um, you know, 23 to 30-some percent of the market in browsers. And then there's this. Uh, this, which has been obsessing me for the last few months, um, uh, the NSA. But I want to focus again in this context on two things that are new threats. The first is, this is essentially the mirror image of what I described about SOPA PIPA. This is the image of the government using the fact that private companies generate massive amounts of data about people to get at information that otherwise they couldn't get. And so essentially what you get is an increasing sophistication by the government of the ability to leverage the capacities of private companies to get at information. So that's just the mirror image, the completion of the public-private partnership for different model, for different questions of social control. 
Um, the second thing, though, and that's the broader thing, is the rise of big data allowing the uh, uh, refinement of knowledge about people such that information re-emerges as a technology of control and manipulation rather than a technology of distributed production. So it's complicated, right? Big data is great. You want to find, you're going to be able to find uh, 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 new diseases. You want to be able to find outbreaks and fight them. It's not as though there's this big, dark, evil, oh, I don't know what. But at the same time, the big shift here is the relative ease of applying control to large populations in a very exquisitely refined way that flips the degree to which information is primarily about control as opposed to primarily about this decentralized um, uh, autonomy. Um, then there's markets uh, and, and market practices and the rise of the couch potato. So I took this out of, of Wealth of Networks in 2006. I made this, this comparison of Barbie on different searches. And this was, uh, uh, and this was uh, Google. And in Google, the third one down was already Adios Barbie. And then it was, if you were Barbie, which messed up version would you be? And the Visible Barbie project and all sorts of critical things. And I tried to show that Overture, where you paid for placement, was much worse and clean. But actually, if you run it uh, yesterday, meh, not so much. Not so critical after all. What am I trying to capture with that? The question is the extent to which, as the number of people playing on the net rises, as the proportion of the population rises, to what extent, this, by the way, is, is um, the proportion of web traffic uh, uh, carried by Netflix and YouTube and Hulu and Amazon Video. And Netflix is tremendous. And this is very skewed because video is so heavy. So if you actually look at various other kinds of applications, uh, uh, not using complete data, but using actual events, uh, it's much more diverse and complex. It's not yet finished. But the fear, the concern I'm putting on the table is the extent to which the first and second generation of radically distributed cultural production is being displaced by a resurgent of market actors who learn how to use the refinement of taste and consumption to recreate the couch experience. I don't know that we uh, uh, know the answer to that. There's a capture of the idea of sharing and cooperation into what is essentially branding of services. So really, Uber is car sharing? Uh, it's a taxi service. Zipcar, I mean, Robin Chase certainly created Zipcar with a strong sharing ethos. But it's a rental company. You still see blah, blah car maybe in Europe, which seems to be more cooperative. Airbnb is the sharing economy? No, it's just a very good distributed market for uh, 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 bed and breakfast. Couch surfing is different. It's not over, but it's a strong uh, competition over the ethos of sharing, whether it becomes a feel-good brand or whether it's a genuine alternative mode of living. Um, I don't think the outcome is determined, but I also don't think the outcome is assured. Um, we talked about alienated labor and, and, and Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, we talked a little bit about Wi-Fi, right? So this is the Wi-Fi community built by you, which means British Telecom, if you're a subscriber, lets you put one in, in your home and you share it with all of the other BT subscribers. And then we've got the very limited success of these models um, and the challenges we face, right? The, the challenges we face in academia, whether it's open access publishing and the question of all of the efforts to sort of go after the, some, of the, some of the efforts to go after fees and create um, um, not particularly attractive journals and the question of how we organize. The question of MOOCs and the question of, of administrations that sometimes are looking for business models and brand as opposed to uh, um, online uh, engagement and the tension between norms of science and public education and norm and, and, and the, the logic of the margin, trying to find ways of lowering the cost of academic labor and increasing uh, uh, the capacity to intake uh, tuition. These are the current battles. If the first generation of battles 
were primarily about industrial economy actors trying to control particular points of control that allowed them to maintain their old business model against a new threat, whether it was Hollywood in the recording industry, whether it was the telco providers. The new set of challenges we face come from inside the networked economy. They come from the technological shifts to the handheld. They come from the technological shifts to the cloud. They come from the organizational and interorganizational shifts of uh, the public-private partnership for reintroducing control. They come from some of the applications of big data. But they also come from the marketing incorporation of the ideal and ethos of cooperation and commons production into what are effectively market production. So what we have here is essentially an infiltration of this economy by other models. Um, this is just a detail of everything I just said. Um, so let me finish with these two thoughts. Long ago, say in the olden days, 15 years ago, Jamie Boyle uh, uh, came up with this trope of thinking of we need an environmentalism for the net. Something that will allow just like environmentalism allowed the hunter and the bird watcher uh, uh, to understand themselves as in the same battle. Something that will allow the free software developer and the documentary filmmaker and the journalist etc., all to see each other as in the same domain. There's another lesson from the environmental uh, movement. And that is that there is no single dimensional solution. It is a complex, persistent problem and by it, I mean emissions of the industrial economy are a complex uh, uh, problem that can't be solved on one dimension and can't be solved with once and for all solutions. It's a continuous struggle across multiple dimensions, um, 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 law and politics, technology and social norms, ethics and organization, science and education, all applied conscientiously. And when I say applied conscientiously, what I mean is they won't just happen. They will happen if the people think it's important to try to do them, even though it's not always convenient. That's what I mean by conscientiously uh, applied across all of these dimensions. And they will come through repeated battles fought uh, uh, over time. The organizing idea that I'm beginning to work with to, to, to pull these things together is this idea of degrees of freedom. We live in diverse systems and subsystems, and we need to fight these battles across all of these different uh, uh, dimensions in each of them. Each subsystem that we stabilize, if we're able to solve academic publishing as an open access publication model, such that it becomes an anchor for all of these other dimensions as a model, as a study subject, as a resource, as an idea, and, a, and, a, and an existence proof, we've created an anchor around which other subsystems can work, and we've created a degree of freedom for people in other frameworks to say, I can use this for this purpose. If I care about development, I won't be able to read the other things that I need to pay thousands of dollars a month to subscribe to, but I can use open access journals. Um, we also need to begin to understand a, 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 a what's involved in uh, freedom as not being the perfection of any single system. Not a perfect discourse, not a perfect market, but bobbing and weaving between systematically and per persistently imperfect systems. Continuously subject to struggle and negotiation, continuously subject to subversion and conflict, done understanding that that's what's going on. Um, such that the practice of freedom becomes the practice of creating degrees of freedom, using them again, identifying the next set of, of threats, and repeating. And I don't think what's at stake is utopia. But if we can pull these strands together to create a plausibly more humane, more social, and yet productively sustainable way of living, uh, that seems well worth it. Thank you.
I mean, it's up to you. Uh, uh, you can do it, or I can do it, whatever you prefer. Actually, I'll, I'll jump in with, uh, uh, let's say that I'm not going to monitor, but I'll ask a last okay. question. Um, yeah. so, a microphone or a You stand there. So, so my question has to do with uh, the point uh, that you made about is what he called uh, diffused uh, authority. And uh, so the point was that, you know, it's not, you know, authority versus no authority, but rather, you know, uh, you know uh, there may be a situation where there is an authority, but, it, it, you know, it can be bypassed. There are, other, there are other ways, there are other options than simply, you know. So to go back to, to the, your ending when you were talking about the appropriation of, of uh, you know, the, either modes or just the rhetoric of sharing. So suppose, suppose uh, uh, I was uh, collaborating to Wikipedia, say, 10 years ago, okay? So Wiki Wikipedia was already doing well, but it wasn't what it is now, okay? So at the point, I may say, okay, look, you know, I, I don't like these rules, blah, blah, blah. I can bail out and start an alternative Wikipedia because Wikipedia is not, it doesn't have quite the monopoly it has today. Now, given the success of this uh, uh, peer-based system, for me to get out of Wikipedia because I don't like the, the power structure, I don't like the rules, the costs are you know, uh, probably prohibitive. So what I'm saying is that the success of this uh, uh, common slash peer-based uh, initiative ends up uh, playing out like uh, somebody developing you know, a monopoly in a certain corner of the market, which then you know, increases very significantly the cost of people who would like to have a different set of rules. You know. So in a sense, the success is, is actually creating perhaps conformity. So, so uh, a couple of different answers. Um, First, if you're talking about creating something that will have the broad global social authority of Wikipedia as the, um, as, as the first line knowledge utility, absolutely you're right. But there are two-ish, two to three different ways in which diversity of constraints enter. First of all, the models of diversity that I talk about are at least in part extracted from the diversity of governance within Wikipedia, such that with sufficient patience and persistence, um, Wikipedia is structured such that you can argue. And when I say diversity, I mean it's very hard to actually get a completely authoritative, that's it, you can't have this argument again model. Not impossible. You can, in some particular ways, maybe get blocked in certain ways. But there's, the, there's a very strong insistence, different admins, different people who can or can't block. ARPCOM doesn't uh, control everything. There, the, the, there's redundancy in the pathways to try to solve the problem such that is very different from a distinct authoritative hierarchy. So the first line is admittedly requires a lot of patience and in some sense is primarily available to the some number of thousands of people who are within rather than the millions of people who read or hundreds of million. That's true and that's a real constraint. But there's a lot of redundancy internally in the pathways of control. Second, um, depending on the ambition, uh, one of the things that you find is that of the 100,000 or so wikis on Wikia, there are quite a few that basically were totally involved in a particular set of articles about whatever, a particular movie or a particular, uh, uh, that the encyclopedia said, enough already. Even, even here, enough already. And so they took and they set up their own uh, 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 space on Wikia. And then they continued to contribute in both places, somewhat shaping the public perspective and somewhat creating their own uh, enthusiast perspective. So that provides partial diversity, not at the largest level. And the third is that uh, there are um, uh, there are 
multiple uh, alternative pathways for expression such that if you can't do the Wikipedia article, there are still other ways to create communities of knowledge. Commu uh, again, these are partial solutions. I think one of the one of the things that I don't know how to deal with, but in some sense I know to be true, but I'm not sure what to do with it yet, is the unsatisfactory nature of accepting that it's all partial, that it's all imperfect. The solution is imperfect, the power is imperfect, power can sometimes be perfect. Um, um, uh, but, but, but how do we come about understanding uh, 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 shrugging, it's not perfect, but it's what I can do, which is really what I just said. And I tried to give details of, of what, there's a very uh, uh, practical minor key aspect to that, but I do think that it's a form of, of quite substantial uh, freedom. Yeah. So I'll repeat the question if you need it there for the okay. video. Um, so, so we we see Wikipedia and um, and Craigslist that seem from another period. And, and the venture capitalists didn't get in there and monetize it. Couchsurfer just took venture capital this week. Um, so is it that the moment they, these were created, and then you have a winner-take-all network economy, as you described, they're able to occupy the space, and nobody's able to push them out. But today, where venture capitalists and those folks are much more sensitive to these kinds of opportunities, this will be much more difficult to do? Is there a historical change? Um, I think that's the right question to ask and begin to look for and study. I think it's too soon to tell based on the observations we have about just how rich the continued universe of uh, peer production and commons-based production continues to be. Um, I think uh, uh, one consequence or, or one implication of the set of threats that I'm identifying is that that's one of the things we need to, we need to continue to monitor and, and, and look for. Uh, and I'd say that the, uh, if I had to predict, I'd say the range and diversity of human interest is still too great for a complete takeover and constraint. You can take over and constrain when you've got limited capacity. At least in the cultural production sector, where you really have incredibly diverse uh, capabilities to just at very low cost produce things, I don't see a complete displacement. But I agree with you that, that, that and, and this is essentially part of what I try to point when I focus on, on the subversion of the sharing economy, uh, uh, is, is the, the risk of an expanded range of practices that will uh, take on some of the feel-good branding without actually implementing the ethos. Uh, and particularly because of the tremendous growth in the number of people using that don't uh, follow a certain... Norms, ethos are things that develop over time. When you've got a dramatically expanding set of users, there's not time for that to constrain the, the, the shape of behavior. So if you have people who grow up with, some, with a computer that they know they can do whatever they want, apps are harder to swallow. When you have people who, whose first interaction is apps, um, an open system is harder to swallow. And, and that's at, at sort of lower down, but the same set of concerns. I think, I, I think that's more what I'm saying we need to look for than that I know which way it'll go. Yeah, you have a mic here. And then, and then. Hi, my name is Jorge Rojas and I work for UC Davis in Chile and mainly in Latin America. Um, we are trying to support the Chilean university system in research and development. Um, when uh, you talk about these issues, uh, some couple of years ago, I was in a conference of vice presidents of research in Latin America. Uh, one of them said, uh, why are we talking here about managing intellectual property? 30 years ago, no one would have been spoken about this issue. So, uh, he was a priest. He was the vice president of a Catholic university. And, and then I went to another conference, and a representative of the Inter-American Development Bank said that 80% uh, of the funding devoted to innovation 
uh, the outcomes are appropriated by 20% of the richest population. And when you see at the patent portfolio in life science, you will see that five or six uh, patent holders manage 75% of the patents, and in the other side, uh, universities, among some many others, manage the rest quarter. So uh, introducing a lot of uh, drama in negotiating uh, ways to do further research to satisfy the needs of the community. So there is a lot of tension, uh, of course, in all of this, and I, I want to be very simple to ask you, what is the standpoint of the public universities, as we as UC Davis and our partners abroad in Chile and Latin America have to take uh, to solve these issues? Um, do we have to believe on that freedom that you mentioned before, or is there anyone that have to come here to try to solve all this drama, all this tension, to make more research that satisfies the needs of the poor? Recently, the, the CEO of Bayer, he just said that he is not doing research to satisfy any uh, health problems of the Indians, but the wealthy people. How can we react as public universities to that lot of drama? So that's a complex uh, question. You got that because he has a mic, right? You don't need me to repeat. Um, a, that's an absolutely critical question. The question of the Bay Dole Act, which starts the uh, patenting of university technologies, is if you look at the, at the intellectual history that I described, that's at the heart of the 80s, 90s period of move everything to property and the rejection of the logic of the public interest. It was a part and parcel of that moment of private property as a necessity if we are to be able to sustain ourselves. One of the things we've seen, uh, and I think we've seen this really for well over a decade now, is a strong movement to make, at a minimum, university science open access. And there have been tremendous uh, uh, efforts uh, uh, on that front. Um, I guess I, I, I uh, uh, um, Personally, I, I, um, um, I wrote a piece with, with a few of my students maybe 10 years ago about equitable access licensing and the idea of requiring universities or, or an agreement between universities that would require anybody who licenses university technologies uh, uh, to, do, to, to license them for developing country, particularly for use uh, 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 freely for uh, uh, poor populations, which doesn't solve the problem of research on poor population, on, on poor population diseases. Um, uh, some of those students went on to form a student organization, University Allied for Essential Medicines, that um, uh, throughout several campuses, including some of the UC campuses, I, I, I don't know about a chapter here or not, trying to, push, uh, um, uh, trying to push universities to adopt. Two, three years ago, several uh, of the major research universities uh, throughout the country adopted such a platform that's not quite open access publishing, but that is some level of open access licensing of patents. It's far from enough. Uh, but I think the point you raise is actually uh, more foundational to the pressure, of, not more foundational. Few things are, are more specifically foundationally important than science that will treat diseases of millions of poor people in the world. So when I say more foundational, I actually mean of broader application. Uh, in, in, um, and that's the tension between the idea of the public university. Actually, this is in connection directly to the series here, as you were mentioning. The idea of the public university and the idea of the public interest generally, and the perceived necessity of the logic of, 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 of the tyranny of the margin, the logic of the, mar of the market. The idea that if you don't propertize, you won't get implementation as opposed to the idea that there are some classes of problems that are not well amenable to solution through property and exclusion, and instead required the creation of whether it be tax-funded, whether it be collaborative and professional, whether it be cross-subsidized by teaching and education, whatever the mix of, of revenue streams is, uh, that the output is in the commons. I think it's a hard problem. 
I think it's one that is that has been at least for a decade part of the family of problems that open access is one of the answers to. Um, I think it's been particularly sticky because of the high capital costs involved, particularly in clinical trials when you're talking about drugs. Um, there's a really interesting, but at the moment very slow, as best I know, effort in India to adopt, to use just public funding from that very large economy into uh, uh, um, diseases of the poor. Uh, certainly, the Gates Foundation has done uh, uh, quite a bit in, in this domain. Um, but that seems to have been, um, uh, there's really interesting work on the lower cost, non-wet things, on open data, on collaborative uh, um, um, uh, annotation, on things that can be done in silico. Uh, but it's all context specific and what the particular domains are. The, the core contribution we have, and this is again the point about progress in different subsystems becoming a place where you can leverage into other areas, is successful proof of uh, 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 models. And successful construction of 60%, 70%, 80% of the way to the ultimate thing both creates the model and simplifies the remaining capitalization of the rest of the problem such that it might or might not make it uh, amenable. That was a very long-winded answer. I'm not sure it actually was. You had your hands. My name, I'm uh, from Toronto. My name is Peter Payfather. I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, uh, and I liked the, the reference to environmentalism at the end. And I read a very interesting uh, uh, post by uh, Norm Chomsky on the uh, Charter of the Forest, you know, this fundamental charter of English public law uh, that, that accompanied the Magna Carta, this idea that the forest, these, these public domains that are uncontrolled except by the king, uh, should be made accessible uh, for various purposes, for various traditional purposes. And, and I, I wonder if this idea of the forest uh, could be uh, incorporated in here as, you know, it's not, you talked a lot about productivity and uh, economies and labor, but there's this general enjoyment of science, this, this curiosity that, that is of benefit to the wider uh, uh, group. And then there's the diversity, uh, the, the degrees of freedom implied by a, a, a diverse forest. So. Uh, is that third domain of the forest uh, something that needs to be considered? Two answers that sort of conflict with each other. Um, the first is, um, I think it's precisely that, no, one answer that has got two parts. Um, the idea of the commons and the way in which the commons uh, became such a central organizing principle uh, politically, socially, culturally in the last 15 years, um, at least in one of its meanings, plays exactly that role. Um, the one of those meanings is that meaning that I had of these three meanings down here on the bottom uh, that I didn't spend a lot of time on. Uh, but there are certainly people who focus on that. I think. Um, I think plausibly because uh, innovation was such a central part of the story in the information economy, plausibly because um, at least for some of us, let's put it, at least for me, it was important to meet the argument on its own ground and win there that those aspects of the commons were more central to the argument. Um, but that's partly what I was trying to emphasize, that there's a potential tension between these different meanings of the commons, and that if we spent the last 15 years holding hands because there was a, a shared sense of whatever are the distinctions between us, they are smaller than the distinction between us and those who are trying to make sure that it all remains well behaved within a proprietary hierarchical model, uh, I think we're, in, we're safe enough, except we're not, uh, to be able to explore the limitations of one or another as they limit each other. Um, but I don't think we've even been 
aware in our writing of these tensions, or at least we haven't. I'm, I'm curious, Mario, because you've been looking at this, to what extent you've seen the, the, that tension be explicit. I, I have not so much. I think, you know, one tension that uh, I think you brought up, uh, you know, quite well when you were talking about Those who talk about the commons as, as, as a place, the pasture, you know, so, and instead those, like your argument, that focus on the movement through the commons. So it's more like, it's about the kind of actions that are enabled, and they focus on strangers, you know, people outside of the community as opposed to all the members of these ideal little communities with the little cows on their communal <laughs> So I think that that's it. Chris? I'm not sure whether I actually have a question. I just, I think, I think we want to highlight a couple of things. One of which is that I, I found your talk incredibly confusing, which is meant as a compliment. From coming from someone who knows this stuff intimately. And it's because I think it is a really confusing time. And part of what strikes me about what you're saying is that that whole center part of your talk about the model of production, of peer production, is a production model. And the kind of thing that we're dealing with trying to understand now is two other sides of the equation. That is the consumption side, the re-entrance, the reappearance of the, of the couch potato, right? The re-entrance of what is actually a much more massive scale of, in, of attention and spending and circulation of, 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 of capital and investments on the one hand. And then also the investment component, which was highlighted here, which is that we've seen this incredible, absolutely incredible concentration of wealth in a, in a few small centers, largely controlled by venture capital and the largest firms who've entered this space, right? So the depressing part about the story you're telling is that the promise, utopian or not, of the pure production model might actually be restricted to this small partial solution of commons-based pure production, which is good in some places and not in others. And what we don't understand is the re-entrance, the reappearance of the, the couch potato. And I was thinking about this because I got called by a journalist to talk about programmers. <laughs> who are um, the new sort of cultural <laughs> boogeyman for people in peer production and free software, right? Apparently dominating the, ex the existence of um, the programming and, and, and Silicon Valley industry in San Francisco. And the question I asked was really, do we need to actually talk about programmers? That's an interesting and funny sort of cultural um, effect. Or do we need to actually be focusing a lot more attention on the concentration of wealth in the venture capital sphere and the reemergence of consumption and demand as the driver of many of these phenomena. And I saw all of those in your talk, right, as things that you're trying to sort of piece together, and I think that that is the moment that we're living in. And this has driven home to me even more in the open access debates, where that really is a domain that is somewhat smaller scale than the kind of consumption that either Hollywood or Silicon Valley deal with now, and deals with a, a, a orders of magnitude less money but is trying to solve a particular problem alongside entrants into it from the scholarly publishing industry who are tyrannized by the margin and who are you know, um, subject to the demands of this consumer economy that's dominating the, the way that they operate. And so it's that interface between those two that I think we're dealing with in the university. So like I said, not a question, but very illuminating. It's, but I'm curious, but, but in this regard, I'm actually curious to hear, if, if you don't, I'll ask you a question then. Um, <laughs> Open access has the advantage that it is layered on top a production system that is itself heavily service-based in the sense of teaching. Uh, service as opposed to you have to wrap the product and sell it as a product and that's how you, expro and that's how you appropriate the rents. Um, heavily publicly funded. Uh, with an incredibly powerful ethos of um, resistance, right? The town gown uh, 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 conflict is not a new one. 
Mario, I'm sorry. You're about to come at me with the Galileo, I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so the question is the extent to which open access is a really important place. Because if it can't work here, we're relatively speaking. Actually, this is a much less abstract version of the answer I was giving earlier with regard to drugs, which is to say, how much of the problem can you solve before you hit the capital constraints that require the introduction of a model that then is tyrannized by the margin? And for open access, so much, right? The people who write, the people who uh, peer review, in many cases, the people who edit, all of that is already solved. And then you've got this sort of reap where others have sown moment. Um, and so in some sense, there's an enormous uh, uh, burden that this community carries to solve the problem. Because in some sense, if it's not solvable here, it's certainly not going to be solvable there. Um, but at another, there's also tremendous opportunity. So now this yeah, is like, yeah, I asked you a question as much as you <laughs> asked me a question. <laughs> but, but I definitely agree that solving the problem of open access, and, and here's a really concrete way of putting it, which is that we have the money in the system to solve the problem, but we don't spend it on solving the problem. And that is a, that is a result of the historical way the political economy has been organized. And it's a tremendous force of political will to spend the money differently, but we could do it and solve the problem. I must also preface by saying that, like the gentleman before me, uh, I was also quite confused by your talk, uh, but that's purely my deficiency. Um, the problem that I face in, in my job is trying to reconcile economic models that can sustain or that can coexist with open whatever, open access or open data or open science. Uh, and it seems to be... Uh, a world with very few uh, tested, tried and tested, uh, successful business models. You know, give a product for free, uh, make money on advertising, or maybe make money on some uh, premium products, uh, or sell back something, uh, uh, secondary services maybe, uh, open access sort of, a software sort of like that, you know, provide the software for free and then provide consultancy services, etc. But uh, data is a beast which has a very long-term uh, sustainability problem. Uh, you don't just collect data and then try and maintain it for a couple of years or three years, I mean, you know, or even 30 years. Hopefully, till the end of time, uh, we'll, we'll have the data available. Uh, because once it goes away, it goes away, particularly historical data. Once it goes away, it goes away. Uh, since you're the invited speaker, uh, I would like you to look in the crystal ball and, 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 and come up and share with us what you think might be economic models that can actually sustain this tension between the need for these highly capital intensive uh, enterprises such as open data, which is really, really very expensive to maintain, especially if you want to maintain it uh, in a sensible way and not just put it, put it up on an, uh, you know, an FTP server somewhere. Uh, but actually curate it and provide services that add value to it. How to do that in a way so that it is available in what we conceive as, as free, freely and openly, and yet uh, without bankrupting those who are providing the service? Okay, so, so let me preface my answer by saying any question of that kind I don't believe in answers that are general and abstract and by analogy from other places as opposed to a detailed analysis of the particular set of costs, the particular set of institutions and organizations, the particular existing and possible funding models. And I have not studied a model for open data. So let's start with that and then I'll relatively briefly say a couple of things, but, but only really that because I, I don't want to pretend like I've studied it and I know and I refuse to accept the idea that somehow you can come up with an off-the-shelf model that will apply to you because it applied to music. Um, uh, to me, the critical first move is decomposition of the sources of the cost 
and the sources of the um, um, and the sources of capital. No question that a highly capitalized process um, will pose real problems, and this was part of my answer with regard to wet science uh, here. Now, to what extent is open data integrated into systems that we, for which we already have public and philanthropic funding? If it is, that solves part of the problem. To what extent is the cost of the data uh, the physical servers? If it is, then the question is, is there a distributed solution that can take, uh, um, that can take advantage of um, um, radically distributed infrastructure? So again, not to wave freedom box, which is not really deployed, et cetera, but the idea of there's a whole class of problems that come with cloud computing for which one class of answers is that we need to adopt devices that will redistribute cloud storage to something that people have uh, in their homes and then share when they don't use it. That's a class of solutions. To what extent is it about the development of software uh, that manages the database and, um, um, and, and, and database and annotation? These are things, each of which we have in other areas uh, distributed solutions for, be it MySQL for databases, be it distributed annotation of, of uh, um, 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 uh, SNPs or whatever it is that, that's, that's been done. And the question then becomes, can you come up with a sufficiently uh, layered solution that, that decomposes the problem into things that are solvable such that you may leave at the end um, uh, a solvable solution in terms of its financing? Has everything that I said now, you might come back and say, no, 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 you don't understand. It's got to be this huge cluster. It's got to work in this particular way, and otherwise it won't work, at which point I'll say, OK, if you're persuaded, then that's a real capital constraint. And still I'll point to distributed storage and computation as potential alternatives. Over there, there's sure. a hand. Yes, I, I think that uh, let, let's take a last question. Last question, and OK. And uh, we'll continue the conversation uh, okay. informally. Last question then over there. You're, you're using that not because I can't hear you, but because he's, he wants to videotape your, uh, your question. <laughs> Which if you now resist and say that you don't want to be taped, they... Okay, it's in now. Okay, um, and um, I don't, I don't, I, I guess I don't have a question exactly. I kind of do. But, um, but first, it seems to me in some sense that some of the things that you've said, I see where you're going, but in some sense, I feel like it's kind of a bit of a false economy. Because the number of people who could ever use a computer to do whatever they wanted was always limited. And it's not as if Windows was an especially open system, and that's what most people were using. And so to move over to a, to a, to a, to a smartphone now that locks you out more completely doesn't seem to make that much difference to most of the people. And then also, it seems like maybe the couch potato had, was always there. He was just watching cable TV. Now he's moving over to getting online. And so I'm wondering, like, what is it that, um, you know, like, um, help me see the light here. What are we really losing, and, um, and how can we really attack it? Because it seems like the Wikipedia thing maybe made it so everybody could put their piece of knowledge in there, and everybody cares about what they know. But when it comes to, like, a process of writing an app or something, I don't even get involved with that, and I could, but I'm like, oh, it's a lot of work, and somebody else already did it, it's free. <laughs> you know, so... That's a good ending. Uh, <laughs> um, to persuade you that Windows 8 is more closed than prior versions in terms of the ability to install something that is not authorized, um, it seems to be a little harder to install things that aren't authorized uh, coming from somewhere else. Uh, to persuade you that however strong Microsoft was in the market, it, broadly speaking, had open APIs, it broadly ran on a commodity PC, and it broadly ran on something that very naughty applications could be installed on and not uh, removed or blocked, um, it was. 
Um, and, and some pretty cool things came out of those naughty things that got installed on, on, on PCs. Um, so the marginal freedom to disrupt, and, and uh, I'm sorry, that actually connects to the point about the couch potato. Um, and it's a, really, it's a really hard thing that comes out of the fact that we use the term democratization and we have a sense of democratization as something that must involve one person, one vote. But really this is about vanguards and the, and, and the way in which particular groups, subgroups, people are able to nudge the environment that everybody else occupies, uh, even if they're not part of it, right? Even today, there are tens of thousands of Wikipedians. There are hundreds of millions of readers, but there are really only tens of thousands of Wikipedians. There are a few million free software developers, and the overwhelming majority of them are one person per project, not peer production. Uh, and yet, they produce all sorts of things that are a little quirkier and to the side, and for some people can, can create these activities. And the real question to me is not, will we always have the East Village where really cool stuff is happening on the side, but is well segregated from the rest of the economy? But the degree to which, given that you have some vanguard, it's relatively easy and seamless to generalize into the general population, or that there are very discrete fences that can be controlled from a center that can keep the fringe at the fringe and not let it generalize. And there, it's less about whether every individual can be part of it, but rather whether a sufficiently large minority of vanguard players in all sorts of places, right? it's not the same people, can influence the environment that everybody occupies. Thank you Thanks. so much.